I want to really welcome you to uh, to Pittsburgh, the home of the six-time Super Bowl champs. Uh, <laughs> calm down. Let me tell you what we say in Pittsburgh. The Pittsburgh Steelers have six Super Bowl rings. The Pittsburgh Penguins have three Stanley Cup rings. And the Pittsburgh Pirates have onion rings. <laughs> I, uh, I want to really talk a little bit about your union and your leadership. All those things that Larry said I was there on, we were there together. And in many of those issues, in particular the fights over EFCA, particularly the fights over trying to save our democracy, the fight to try and fix the broken Senate. I was there, but Larry was ahead of me. And your union with your leadership in many ways became the moral fiber of that fight and refusing to give up. And yes, the democracy that we love is under attack and it's being ripped away from us. Because of the broken Senate rules, because of the abuse of the filibuster, primarily by Republicans, but in many times, sisters and brothers, with the tacit consent of Democrats and the de tacit consent of the leader of the majority sometimes, we have a system that can't deliver. It can't deliver on basic fundamental rights. Employee Free Choice Act, the right to organize. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. Look at what's happened to workers' income, and it parallels the erosion of the right to collective bargaining. Look at what's happened to the middle class, and it parallels the decline in the labor union density in the country. And the elites, the rich and the powerful, the 1 percent, they're quite comfortable with that, and in fact, they like it. When we can't even get a National Labor Relations Board to be staffed, when we can't get judges through. You know that the Republican plan is to jam the system up, to make sure as little as possible gets done. And let me make a statement that might be controversial, but it's one I believe. A large part of the Republican agenda is they can't stand that there's a black man in a White House, and we ought to take them on about that. We ought to make sure that they understand. We ought to make sure that they understand that we know the difference of what's going on. And if you listen carefully, you can have arguments about whether our president did enough or didn't do enough or whatever direction. But there's two things that are at stake here that are fighting with each other. You got the president's agenda that's about growth, it's about trying to move some progressive stuff in the right direction. Maybe or maybe not. Maybe he doesn't fight hard enough for him, but he believes it. And then you got the other side, and that the only thing they talk about is austerity. They talk about cutting Social Security, cutting Medicare, cutting every social program we have. We got the sequester that is going to be hardest on working class people when it's all in place. You want to see what austerity brings you? Follow the global economy and see what's going on in Europe. See what's going on in the United Kingdom, where you've got now the UK heading for its quadruple dip recession. You've got people that never had to live in cars before living in cars now because they used to have social programs and now they're gone. So what's the first thing we need to do? We need to build a movement. Some folks may not like this. Not one progressive group, including the labor movement, is going to be able to change the direction of the country on their own. We need to bring our allies in. We need to work with people of faith. We need to work with people that are going to be looking for equity and equality. We need to work with every social movement that we can to build a real movement. And we need to reclaim our democracy. And one of the first things we need to do to do that is to fix the broken Senate. And maybe we can't fix the broken Senate till we get the damn money out of politics. My vote is not for sale, and neither should anyone else's be.
The hard, the hard reality is that it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be the way that it's going. A long, long time ago, in one of our trade fights, I heard someone say that there was an old Chinese proverb. I, I don't know if it's true or not that it was a Chinese proverb, but it went sort of like this. Unless you change direction, you will continue in the direction in which you are heading. Sounds pretty simple. When I heard it, I thought, oh, what the hell's that? But when you start to think about it, sisters and brothers, we can't continue as a society in the direction in which we are heading. If we continue in that direction, think of what we're leaving the next generation and the generation after that. I don't want that my generation left this country screwed up. I don't want that my generation didn't leave the country and the labor movement in a better position than we inherited. And the only way, the only way that we're going to succeed in changing direction is by rebuilding a movement. You know that our friend Cecil Roberts from the mine workers has interesting comments. Dr. King didn't just write letters to the president. He mobilized people and they marched. Gandhi didn't free India by writing letters to the queen. He marched. And when his oppressors beat him down and knocked him to the ground, he didn't get up and write a nasty letter. He got up and he marched and others joined him. When Nelson Mandela was put in jail, he didn't just write letters to his oppressors. From jail, he built a movement. And that movement not only freed him, but freed the country. So sisters and brothers, we got to quit writing letters. And we got to start marching. We got to start getting in the streets and telling people, we're not taking this anymore. I don't want to infringe on the time of your conference. So let me just say this. It's time that we made sure that the 99% of us, I don't, I don't like that 99% bullshit. There's, there's too many of them between 90 and 100. The group of us that want a better future for our kids and want a better country. I want to believe, and I do believe, that we can make a difference. We can beat the Wall Street banksters. We can beat the Koch brothers. We can beat that dirty money in politics. We can beat the coupon-clipping, Gucci-shoed, latte-drinking, Lexus-driving, pension-robbing, wage-stealing bunch of bastards that are out there. But we can only do it, but we can only do it, sisters and brothers, if we all pitch in and build the movement. All the other groups that care about the future of our society are ready for change. They're ready to march. They're ready to work. They're ready to do what has to be done. And I want to believe that between now and 2014, we can change the direction of this country. And when our time is up in our union role, we'll be able to look back and say that it's a better country. I travel a lot, and when I travel, I like to try and bring something home for my wife or my kids. My kids are now adults, so I'd maybe bring something home for my grandkids. And not long ago, I was on the West Coast in San Francisco, and I went for a walk, and I walked by this Oriental gift shop, and I'm looking in the window, and there's this brass rat that's sitting there in the window looking at me. This brass rat has eyes that just sort of peer right through you. And I thought, boy, that'd be nice. I'll bring that home, use it for a doorstop at the cabin. So I went in and I said to the old guy behind the counter, he's one of the long beard. I said to him, that brass rat in the window is really interesting. How much is it? He said, well, the brass rat itself is 25 bucks, but uh, the story that goes with it is 250. 
He says, I don't need any story. I just want the brass rat for doorstop. He says, well, I'll sell it to you, but you, you probably want the story. I said, no, I don't want the story. I just want the rat. So I buy the rat, and he gives it to me in a bag, and I start walking back to my hotel. And as I start walking, I hear little footsteps behind me. And I look, and there's about a dozen rats following me. Well, that's kind of weird. I start walking a little faster. All of a sudden, I, hear, I look behind me. Now there's dozens and dozens of rats. I figure, oh my God, I start running, and I'm running towards the bridge. And all of a sudden, things are jumping on me and pulling on my clothes and ripping all over the place. And I look behind, there's got to be 100,000 rats. I figure, it's not me they want, it's this damn brass rat. And I take it and I heave it as far as I can. And it goes out into the ocean. And these rats run right by me and they jump off the bridge and into the ocean and drowned. And wow, that was close. I walk back to the Oriental gift shop. There's a little old man sitting there with a big, huge grin on his face. He said, I knew you'd be back. He said, I bet you want the story. I said, no. Do you have a brass Republican? <laughs> Thank you very much.